It's a pleasure for me to introduce my friend Pera Ara from Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, uh, who will speak today about uh, cross products and Atillas problem. So, Pera. Okay, so thank you. And well, thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar. So I will talk well, essentially on this Atillas problem. So let me... Um, first, uh, we have this outline. So I will give some introduction and preliminary definitions, then some positive and negative results on Atillas conjecture. Then I will talk about some tools to uh, deal with the problem, with the star regular rings and Sylvester matrix rank functions. And then I will give some uh, methods on cross products, algebras, yeah, in order to study uh, the conjecture. Well, also here I mentioned a dynamical perspective, but I think I will not have time to explain really this uh, dynamical way in which uh, these algebras are defined. So I just will define as in terms of uh, generators. So, well, that all began with uh, uh, the work by Atilla in his uh, joint work with Singer. He introduced L2 Betty numbers. So he uh, wanted to extend the Atilla Singer theorem to the setting of uh, if you have a, a discrete group acting uh, co compactly on, on a space. And well, he then to study this problem, he introduced these um, uh, methods. And well, essentially, L2 Betty numbers are defined as certain von Neumann dimensions of uh, homology Hilbert modules of L2 chain complexes associated to finite, connected, and free sheet, uh, CW complex, where she is a group. Well, I uh, it's not important that we understand all, all these things because I, I will define later uh, what is. But uh, essentially, you try to imitate the, the things in, in algebraic geometry, but in the context of in the analytic context. Okay, so uh, having instead of a usual chain complex an L two chain complex, it's a, a complex of Hilbert modules. <clears throat> Then in, in his paper, Atilla observed that in case she is a finite group, the L2 Betty numbers coincide, modulo rescaling by the number of elements of the group, with the previously known Betty numbers. Thus, in this situation, they are in fact rational numbers. And in, also in much other cases, they give rational numbers. So, and then Atilla posed the following question which is nowadays uh, commonly known as the Atilla conjecture, although he was not making any conjecture, it was just a question, okay? So he posed the question that if it's possible to obtain irrational values of these of this numbers, of L2 Betty numbers. This is the question that Atilla posed, okay? So, also, this is the approach that we will follow here. So we will take a quite algebraic approach. So L2 Betty numbers can be defined in an algebraic setting without referring to manifolds or she CW complexes. And this is the way that we will define. So, and following this algebraic point of view, stronger questions in relation with the original Atilla question were formulated over the years. I will describe later what are these uh, questions, but before we give more details on this uh, subject, we will introduce uh, the basic definitions in order that everybody can understand the problem. Okay, so now we will begin with some basic definitions of the uh, objects that we will study. Then, um, well, we will study these L2Betty numbers for group algebras, okay? So we will assume always that we have a discrete group. So she is a 
discrete countable group, and then we have any subring of the complex numbers, which is closed under complex conjugation, and then we consider the group algebra or the group ring. Okay, just uh, written like this. So formal sums with all elements in the ring or and almost all are zero. Okay, it's a usual structure of group is star algebra because uh, all the, the algebra is the usual one. So it's the complex involution on R, which is closed under the involution and the inverse on the elements of the group, okay? <clears throat> also, we will consider the space L2 of G. This is the Hilbert space of all square summable functions from G to the complex numbers endowed with this scalar product like here. And we will use this notation for the canonical orthonormal basis. Well, this is the, the function which takes the value one at gamma and zero on all the other elements of the group. So it's the uh, canonical orthonormal basis of this Hilbert space. And then we uh, take the group and we make it uh, act faithfully on this uh, Hilbert space by left or right multiplication. So it's the lambda will be left multiplication and this rho will be right multiplication. These are defined in, in this way. So here we left multiply and here we right multiply by the element of the group. And well, uh, this is the, the definition then uh, both lambda and rho extend linearly to actions of the group algebra on L2 of G by bonded operators preserving the star operation. And we will identify indeed uh, the group algebra with the image through the lambda, okay? So through a left multiplication, okay? Inside the bonded the algebra, the star algebra of bonded operators on the Hilbert space L2 of G. Also, we will uh, consider the group on Neumann algebra, which well, well, can be defined in various ways, uh, but here maybe it's uh, nice this description. So the group on Neumann algebra can be described as those operators such that commute with the right action, with the action on the right, by, by the multiplication on the right by elements of the group. Okay, so that's the group on Neumann algebra. And over here, this algebra uh, has a normal positive and faithful trace, which is defined in this way. So we have for a, an, an element T in the group on Neumann algebra. This is the, the element in the L2 of C corresponding to the neutral element. And then this is the definition. And well, here you can notice that for an element in the group algebra, this trace is simply the coefficient of the neutral element. So it's the coefficient AE corresponding to the neutral element. Okay, so we have this definition and then we can extend this definition to matrices. Okay, so the algebra of matrices over the group algebra acts faithfully on this Hilbert space, K copies of L2 of C by left or right multiplication and uh, the corresponding von Neumann algebra corresponding to this action turns out to be nothing else than matrices K by K over the von Neumann algebra N of G. Okay, so indeed we then work with matrices over the von Neumann algebra N of G of the group. Okay, and well, the trace that we are considering before can be extended to an unnormalized trace uh, over this matrices, so it takes the value K on the unit here by setting, uh, well, this definition. So we uh, make the sum on the elements on the main diagonal, the traces of these elements, and we sum all these traces and we get this unnormalized trace on matrices. Okay, and now we can define also another K concept which is the concept of what is a finally generated, in this case, Hilbert model. So a finally generated Hilbert right G model over group G 
is any closed subspace of L2 of G to the K, this is a Hilbert space, which is invariant under uh, diagonal multiplication by, by on the right, okay? So that's it's invariant under this um, representation, okay? Okay, so when we have a finally generated Hilbert G module, the corresponding orthogonal projection operator, which projects onto this space, belongs to the von Neumann algebra, okay? Belongs to this algebra, which was nothing else that matrices K by K over the group von Neumann algebra of G, okay? So this algebra contains all the projections associated to Hilbert G models. And then we can now define <laughs> this uh, first uh, main concept, which is the von Neumann dimension of a finally generated Hilbert module. The von Neumann dimension of B is just the trace of this projection, okay? So the trace of this element in the von Neumann algebra or matrices on the von Neumann algebra, this algebra here, we take the value corresponding to the trace of this operator, and this is by definition the von Neumann dimension of the finally generated Hilbert G model. Okay. So this is the, the numbers that appear here in, in this context. So the numbers that we want to study coming, as we will see now, from elements of the group algebra. Okay. So now we take a matrix operator coming from the group algebra, okay? So all the coefficients are in the group algebra over the complex numbers for some positive integers. And we define the L2 Betty number of this matrix by the following formula. So this is just the von Neumann dimension of the kernel of this operator, okay? Recall that this operator acts on the left, okay? On L2 of the corresponding L2 she to the K, okay? And this, well, by, by what I have said before, just to recall, this is just the trace of the uh, orthogonal projection onto this, the kernel of, of the A, okay? Kernel of A, A here, we look at this as an operator on the Hilbert space L2 of G to the K. Okay, then if we have a subfield of the complex numbers, which is close under conjugation, the set of all L2 Betty numbers of operators coming from matrices over the group algebra for any K will be denoted in this way. So it's the set C of G, K. Okay? So G is the group and K is this subfield, okay? And will be referred to as the set of all L2 Betty numbers arising from G with coefficients in the field K, okay? So this is the set we want to study. And what properties uh, has, well, uh, we can say that it's always a sub group of the real numbers, of the positive real numbers with respect to the sum, okay? So it's a sub group here. And then, well, it's also uh, natural to consider the, sub the subgroup of, of the real numbers generated by this sub group, okay? So G, or call, calligraphic G of G and K is the subgroup generated by this subsemi group. So the, the, the group of differences, okay? Okay, so on the one, we can now um, recover what we were uh, saying before, that is uh, following this algebraic point of view, stronger questions um, uh, in relation with the original ideas question were formulated. So we, we will see now what are these questions. One of the strongest versions is the so-called strong Adia conjecture. This was first considered by Schick, as far as I know. And it, it is, uh, the statement is as follows. So it says the following. The set of L2 Betty numbers arising from a group G with coefficients in, in a subfield as before, K, is contained in the subgroup generated by the inverses of the orders of the finite subgroups of the group, okay? So this is what is called the strong idea conjecture, okay? 
Okay, it, it claims that all these numbers are contained in this subgroup of the rational numbers. Okay. In particular, it claims that all two L2 Betty numbers are rational in particular, but it's more, it's stronger, okay? But this, in this generality has shown to be, uh, to have a negative answer. And we will see later that uh, the first counterexample is the Lamblighter group. I will say more about this later, okay? But this, in this generality, this conjecture is false. So, so, so may, may I ask a yes. yes. question? So the, the field K plays no role? Uh, for the conjecture, no. But okay. then there are results, positive results that are obtained only for the uh, rational numbers, for the field of rational numbers, for example, or for the, um, uh, the algebraic closure, for example, the rational number. So um, in principle for the conjecture, no, but maybe uh, you can get positive results for fields which are smaller than the complex numbers, okay? And, and this is, has been the case in, uh, for several results, okay? So, but, the, but for the conjecture, no. The conjecture doesn't uh, say anything about the field. So, okay. so, but, but so, yeah. the, the counter example here depends on the field? No, no, the field is the, the rational numbers. It's ah, the smallest okay. possible. So the, the coefficients are in the rational numbers for this counter example. I will say later, but the let me fails. Okay, so now the, there is a case which, in which the conjecture, and I think this is very important, in which the conjecture is still open, and this is the what I have said here, the bounded case. The bounded case of the strong idea conjecture is still open. So here, uh, well, there are uh, many results, and it's still open. What says this um, uh, bounded uh, strong at the conjecture, say so suppose that there exists an upper bound for the orders of the finite subgroups of here. So the orders of finite subgroups have a bound, okay, an upper bound. Then the strong at the conjecture holds for she. Okay. So then well, we can say that this L2 betting numbers belong to uh, the subgroup generated by one divided by the minimum common multiple of all the orders of these finite subgroups. Okay, so that, that is a uh, statement in this case. Okay, a cyclic uh, subgroup of the integers, of the rationals, sorry. So observe that in particular, when she is torsion free, the conjecture as asserts that the set of L2 Betty numbers arising from a group she, which is torsion free, is precisely the set of non-negative uh, non integers, okay? So it says that it's exactly the set of all non-negative integers. And this is the connection with the uh, conjecture what we were talking before the talk about the Kaplansky's conjecture on zero divisors, which says if we have a torsion free group and K is indeed any field, the conjecture says that the group algebra K of she has no zero divisors, so it's a domain, okay? no zero divisors. And we can uh, say, and then we will, we will precise more even this uh, fact that uh, indeed it's easy to show that for a torsion free group, the strong Adillo conjecture implies Kaplansky's conjecture. So if you show what well, for the complex numbers, of course, we cannot say about a, com a field of characteristic of positive characteristic. So maybe it's a different problem, but for complex numbers and probably characteristic zero is subsummed here, okay? So, and, and then, uh, well, and indeed if we have an element in the group algebra, which is non-zero, then uh, we can compute the kernel of this operator, the operator uh, which is in one dimension only, and this, by the properties of the dimension, is a, a number which is between zero and one, and cannot be one, okay? Because the, this, uh, this is faithful. This, uh, so this uh, 
element is, is uh, different from zero, this cannot be one. And if the, uh, if the strong Atiyah conjecture holds, this number must be an integer. So this integer must be zero, okay? So this must be zero, and then this implies that the kernel of A is zero, and this immediately implies that A is a non-zero dimension. So the proof is very easy, as you see, because these numbers uh, only take, when you take an element in the group algebra, are the values are between zero and one, it can only take uh, integer values, well, you have very few possibilities and you immediately get the result, okay? So, well, um, along the years, there has been a lot of work on this bounded version of the strong Atiyah conjecture, in particular in the torsion-free case, but also in, in other cases. And well, the first substantial result in this direction was obtained by Linnell, by Peter Linnell in 1993. And it says the following. So let's see, be the smallest, smallest class of groups which contains all free groups and is closed and their directed unions and extensions with elementary amenable groups. Okay, so it's a large class of groups. Well, of course, yeah, in particular, uh, contains all elementary amenable groups. Then the bounded version of the strong idea conjecture holds for she in this class, okay? So this class, um, when you have a bounded group, which belongs to this class, uh, uh, with this property of boundedness, as an upper bound on the orders of finite groups, then the conjecture holds. Yeah. Well, and along the years, as I said, there are other many classes of groups that, for which this has been proved. I will just give a very uh, enormous jump. I will describe a very recent contribution by Andre Heikin Sapirain and Lopez Alvarez, uh, which concerns a class of groups, which is the class of groups called locally indicable. So a group G is called locally indicable if every non-zero finally generated subgroup admits a non-zero homomorphism to the group of integers. And then, well, it admits indeed a surjective homomorphism to set, okay? So this is the class of locally indicable groups. And some properties of these groups, all groups in this class are torsion free. So here we don't have to um, bother about the condition of, of the boundedness because they are really torsion free. So it's uh, not a problem. And it's quite large. This, this class of locally indicable groups is quite large. For instance, it contains all torsion free one relator groups. One relator groups means that they are given just by one relation, okay? So it contains all these groups. And well, this is the result. So if she is a locally indicable group, then she satisfies the strong idea project, okay? So then um, in particular, one gets that uh, the Kaplansky's conjecture holds here. I think in this case, Kaplansky's conjecture was already known. Okay, so the contribution is to show that satisfies the strong idea. Okay. <clears throat> so now we will move to the non-bounded case. Yes? One question. Is it obvious that uh, there are uh, groups in this class that do not belong to Linnell's uh, class? Uh, yes, well, I, I think there are, yes, there are groups in, in this class that, that are not there. But the obvious, well, I would have to think, but probably one of these torsion-free one relator groups. I think even um, if you take the told me that the there is a okay. candidate in this class of groups, yeah. uh, Take the form not being sophic or something like this. So this this class of groups they can be quite quite strange. Yeah. 
So I Alain don't was have... proposing an obvious. I don't see it example. obvious, but, but sorry. Alain was proposing. Alain was proposing an example. Yeah, the uh -huh. taking the fundamental group of the Riemann surface of higher genus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should work. Okay. Yeah, that's an example. Mm -hmm. Um, so, okay, so now let's go and consider the non-bounded case in which, as I said, there is a counterexample. And this counterexample is the Lamblighter group. Okay, so let me recall the definition of the Lamblighter group. So Lamblighter group is what is called a great product of set two with set. So it means that we take a direct sum indexed by the uh, integers of the group set two. And then we act on this by translation, as uh, here is described. So take the semi-direct product with respect to this action, with respect to the Bernoulli shift, with uh, in this case means that we move to the left, okay? So we move a, a sequence like this to the left, okay? So that's, that's the definition. Then this is the Lamblighter group and can be also described in terms of generators and relations. So if we denote by T, the generator corresponding to the integers and by A sub I, the generator corresponding to the I, uh, a copy of set two, then well, we have this presentation, it means that all elements AI have order two, they commute and well, this translating by conjugation AI, we obtain AI minus one. This group is indeed finally generated, right? So it's finally generated with these relations, okay? So we see it's enough to have T and A zero to uh, construct all the other elements. Okay, so this is a uh, group, it's finally generated by two elements. And then uh, here is the result. So the Lamleiter group, L is a counterexample of the strong Attila conjecture. Indeed, in this case, we have that all finite subgroups of the Lamblighter group have orders which are a power of two, two to the n. But this concrete element here, where E0, recall this was the generator of the copy of set two, okay, an element of order two. Then this is an idempotent, a spectral idempotent corresponding to it. And then we consider the sum of this E0 T, T is the generator of this, the copy of set, plus the star of this element, so it's a self adjoining element. This element, the, the von Neumann dimension of the kernel of this element is exactly one third. Okay, so it's not of the predicted form, it should be one divided by a power of two. Okay, so this is a counterexample of the strong Attila conjecture, okay? So with very concrete element here. Oh, a simpler proof here, well, they use quite complicated proof to obtain this result. But then a simpler proof was later obtained by Dix and Schick. Well, and this shows that the Lamleiter group is a counterexample to the strong Attila conjecture. So, but what about the original Attila's problem? because they are, well, they are rational also, this one pair. So this is not a counterexample of the original Atiyah's problem that asks if these numbers are rational or not, okay? So, and now we have to wait until 2013, where Austin showed that there exists irrational L2 Betty numbers, okay? You know, really, the, it's possible, the answer to, the question of Atiyah is, yes, it's possible to build irrational L2 Betty numbers by showing indeed that the set of all L2 Betty numbers or all groups is an uncountable subset of, of the real numbers. So the proof is not very constructive as you can see. So if you prove that the set of all L2 Betty numbers appear for all possible groups is an uncountable set, then it means that there is one of them which is irrational. So it's this kind of proof. Well, it's a little bit more refined. So Austin indeed considered only L2 Betty numbers coming from an uncountable family of groups of a given form, not all groups, but 
coming from uh, form, which is a, a abelian group, and then the free group acting on it, so the semi-direct products. Uh, and then if you consider an uncountable family and you see that all of them have different uh, L2 beta numbers, and there is one of them which ha has to be irrational. Okay? So, well, that's the, the thing. And well, I just will describe a little bit some of the main ideas that have been used in other um, uh, works related to, to these techniques. Austin used a basic technique that also have been using for other people, which is uh, in this special situation in which you have a group, discrete group, acting on an abelian group. So this is not necessarily abelian, but U is abelian. Then you perform Fourier transform on the group, uh, in the, on the abelian group, not of here, only here, okay? And then this gives an isomorphism of actions from the uh, left multiplication action that I have described for, for the semi-direct product with respect to this action into L2, as I described it before, to the, this situation here. So this is the same group algebra, but now you can see it in this von Neumann algebra, this other von Neumann algebra. Let me say what are the things. So this mu u hat is the normalized hair measure on the compact dual group of u. This means here the counting measure on the other group here, and then you consider this measure. And pi is the left regular representation of the group measure von Neumann algebra. So this is the cross product of this von Neumann algebra with this group. Okay, so von Neumann uh, cross product, okay? And you consider this is called the group measure von Neumann algebra and acts on this Hilbert space, okay? So this translation, then you can work in this context and obtain result, uh, results uh, more easily using this other context here, okay? Also other results related to this, um, which uh, they provide like concrete, groups and concrete um, elements in the group and concrete numbers. And using Turing machines, so it's, I cannot see my own, well, but I, I know what it means. And between other uh, tools, Grabowski showed several results on the Atiyah problem. So for instance, he, in 2014, he showed that the set of L2 Betty numbers arising from L3, L recall was the Lamb-Leiter group, contains this irrational number. So this uh, group uh, has some irrational l 2 numbers like this. And also a result obtained by uh, him and also independently by Pichot, Chik and Su, states that the set of all l 2 numbers arising from finally generated groups is equal to the set of all non-negative real numbers. So every non uh, every real number positive real number uh, arise as l 2 the number of a finally generated group. Also, well, related to this, Grabowski stated a particular form of the Atiyah problem that I just mentioned here, the Atiyah problem for a group G is, well, if you have a group G, give me a description of what is the set of l 2 the numbers arising from G, if this is possible at all. Well, this, I think, an interesting problem and is open, widely open, even for the Lamb-Leiter group. So it's not known. So it's not known what's, what is the set of L2 beta numbers arising from Lamb-Leiter group. And in this context, Grabowski has shown that even this group, the Lamb-Leiter group, gives rise to irrational, in, indeed transcendental, L2 beta numbers. So he built a very, well, this kind of number, which is a transcendental number. So there exists a matrix T with entries in the group algebra and uh, over the integers indeed. 
of the, well, this is the analogous of the lamplighter group, but with uh, an integer p. And this p appears here in, in the formula, such that the dimension of the kernel of t is this number here. Okay. This is a uh, transcendental number. Okay, so now we come to study some tools um, that are uh, useful in the study uh, of the Atelier conjecture. And um, indeed, this setting allow us to uh, state some abstract versions of that year. Okay, so this approach is fundamental in the work of uh, Saikin Sapirain and Lopez Alvarez, and also in my shown work with Jean Claramon on the subject. So many tools here have been developed by Saikin Sapirain. Okay? So let me describe the context. So, well, we begin with the definition of uh, what is a star regular ring and a von Neumann regular ring. So a von Neumann regular ring is a ring with a lot of like inner invertibility. So given any element, there exists another element such that this equation holds. It's kind of quasi inverse for X, okay? So X is X, Y, X. A star regular ring is a regular ring endowed with a proper involution. An involution such that X star X equals zero implies that X is equal zero. And for us, the more important um, example of these uh, rings for this talk is this example due to Murray and von Neumann, which uh, is as follows. So assume we have a finite von Neumann algebra in B of H, then the algebra of unbounded closed operators affiliated to this uh, von Neumann algebra is a star regular ring. And this ring is uh, usually denoted in this way, is U of G. So just let me say that indeed the, there is even a difficulty. So it's uh, not uh, easy, not trivial to show that this is a, an algebra, okay? That is U of G is an algebra needs a proof and the proof is not that easy, okay? So that's not completely trivial, this construction from this point of view. Well, later it was shown that this ring is just the, uh, what is called the classical ring of quotients of this other ring. So in this sense, it's much more easy to understand. So that the elements are fractions of elements of N of G. But well, when Murray and Neumann define it, they define it in this way. And this way is also a nice way to, to see this, this uh, ring, of course. So in a star regular ring, uh, for any element of the ring, there exist unit projections, E and F. A projection is a self-adjoint idempotent in a general uh, star ring with involution. Projection means self-adjoint idempotent, okay? Such that uh, generates the same right ideal as uh, X on an the, for the E and the same left ideal than X um, for the F. And then it's common to denote uh, this idempotence by the left projection of X and the right projection of X. So they are the left and right projection of X. Okay? So you can think of them as like the super projections of the element. So and now there's an important definition here you have any subset of the unital star regular ring, then there exists a smallest unital star regular subring of, of the big ring that contains S. This star regular ring is denoted in this way. So it's, the, it's called the star regular closure of S in O. Okay? So it's the smallest um, star regular subring of R of O that contains S. Okay, so this is the concept of a star regular ring. Now we go to the con uh, concept of uh, what is called a Sylvester matrix rank function. So this generalizes the usual concept of a rank function. So we have uh, here the, all the matrices over the ring. Then a Sylvester matrix rank function on a unital ring is a map defined on all these matrices over the ring, taking values on the real, positive real numbers and non-negative real numbers, satisfying the following conditions. Well, the rank of zero is zero, the rank of the number one, so the element 
the unit of the ring is one, then a property, well-known property of the rank, the rank of a product of two matrices that uh, of the same size that uh, they can be multiplied, is a smaller, less or equal than the minimum of the rank of each one, okay? Then uh, the next property is that the, the rank of a diagonal matrix like this is the sum of the ranks for any two matrices. And the last property is this inequality. So if you have a triangular matrix like this, then the rank of the matrix is bigger or equal than the sum of the diagonal ranks, okay? Rank of M1 plus rank of M2 for any matrices M1 and M2 and M3 of suitable sizes. sizes. So this concept generalizes the concept of the rank, the usual rank in matrices over a field, it, and was uh, first introduced by Malcolmson indeed in order to characterize homomorphisms from a fixed ring to division rings. So in some sense, these homomorphisms are, I will not enter in more explanations, but these homomorphisms are in the of correspondence in suitable sense with the set of rank functions of this kind of rank functions on the ring, okay? Uh, well, some more definitions that we will need. So a rank function is called faithful if the only element with zero rank is the zero element. And well, also you can complete with respect to uh, such a rank function. If you have any Sylvester matrix rank function on a unital ring, you can define a pseudometric by this rule, taking the rank of the difference. And in case the rank is faithful, this becomes a metric. And the ring operations are continuous with respect to this uh, pseudometric D. And the rank extends uniquely to a Sylvester matrix rank function on the completion with respect to the pseudometric. And well, this is called the, the completion. Okay, so that we can extend from using a Sylvester rank function, we can build a completion and extend the rank. Uh, the, the rank is defined, uh, sorry, on, on uh, matrices. Yes. And yet you do not complete the matrices, you complete the ring R. Yes which you yes. view elements of R as one by one matrices. Yes, it's enough. No. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And it is possible to define the von Neumann dimension by means of Sylvester matrix and function as follows. So we recover the previous definition as a rank, okay? Because this, Algebra that I described here, the algebra of modded operators affiliated to the von Neumann algebra of she. This is a star regular ring and possess a Sylvester matrix rank function, which is defined in the following way. So we consider an element in this uh, algebra and define the rank in the following way. So we consider the left projection or the right projection is the same because they are equivalent these elements belong indeed to the von Neumann algebra, this, because they are bounded by bounded projections, okay? And then you can compute the trace in the von Neumann algebra. And this gives a rank, okay? So this defines a rank, a Sylvester matrix rank function on the algebra U of G, okay? So you have this rank, and in particular, we obtain by restriction now a Sylvester matrix rank function on the group algebra for any field K, okay? And so for a matrix operator on, with coefficients in the group algebra, we have that the, uh, recall this was the orthogonal projection on the kernel of A, of this operator, will be uh, the uh, identity k by k minus the right projection of a, okay? So we get the following equality. So the L2-beta number 
of uh, this A will be the dimension of, well, this is the definition, this is the dimension of the kernel, but by this equality here, we know that this is K minus the rank, this rank here of the matrix A, okay? So this rank here, and I will ask to describe the all l 2 beta numbers, okay? So that we have this relation. So we can define in detail 2 beta numbers as the values of rank functions, well, or like these complements, K minus the rank of an element, okay? So it's not exactly the rank of the element, but it's like the, the, this difference, okay? And well, given this formula, it is natural to consider in general, uh, the, say the following definition, have a unital ring and a Sylvester matrix rank function on the ring, then we denote in this way, the set of all real numbers that are of this form, are of the form K minus the rank of A for A in matrices over the ring. And this is the analogous of an L2 Betty number, okay? number of this form. Also, it is quite natural also to define just the set of real numbers of the form the rank of A, where A is a matrix. I, I okay. guess the, the, the first one is always a, a, a semi-group, huh? I suppose, yes. Yes, this is a, a semi-group and this also. Yeah, both are semi-groups, yeah. yes. So both are semi sub semi-groups of the, and then we denote by here K of or the subgroup of the real number generated by one of them or by the other, because they are the same. So if you consider the group, the group of the subgroup of the real generated by these sets is really the same thing. So that then you, there is no difference. But well, in general, I don't know if these numbers, if these sets are the same. For many rings, they are the same, but uh, maybe I, I, I cannot say that they are the same for all rings. So it cannot really, this is a question. But well, let me go to an important uh, theorem by Shaking Sapirain, which uh, relates this set with the star regular closures. So, the result is as follows. Suppose that we have a star regular ring, a star subring of this uh, ring, such that this U is the star regular closure of R in U. Okay, so it is like the minimal star regular uh, uh, subring of U containing the ring R is all the ring U. Okay. Okay. In this case, we have that for this groups, the group corresponding to the ring or is the same as the group corresponding to the, to the ring U, okay? So they have the same set of values. And also here for the, because this is a regular ring, this is the same as the uh, set of values that it takes the corresponding state on K0 of U induced by the rank, okay? So this rank induces a state on K0 and because U is a regular, you have this equality too. So it means that this set of numbers is very, very attached to the structure of the of this U, of this star regular ring, and, and in particular of its of its projections of its idempotents, which are very important because there are a lot of idempotents in such a regular ring. Okay. So I think this result is quite nice because indeed it allows to describe this this set of numbers, of real numbers, in terms really of the structure of a ring, the structure of this ring, of the star regular closure of R in U, okay? So I make explicit some of these questions under which conditions this equality holds, under which conditions this sub group can be recovered from the group, just taking intersection with the positive real numbers, or this other question here, what about group algebras? I don't know any group algebra in which these things fail. So I don't know. Okay, so that's, I think, some questions to think about, especially for group algebras. And well, also what you can consider an analogous to the idea problem for rank functions. So you have a ring with a rank function, how to compute this, this uh, group here, and what about the semigroups? 
In the above setting, the most natural object to study is the, the, is the group by shaking Sapirain's result. It's the more stable object here. Can be described using the, this star regular quotient. Okay. So, and well, we will see below. Uh, well, this question is a little vague, but uh, in some context, it, it makes sense to make this question. Well, it is important to realize that these star regular closures do not depend on the larger star regular ring we are using to define them as follows. So I will here recall a definition also by shaking Shapirain. We have a star ring endowed with a Sylvester matrix rank function. And we say that the rank function is a star regular rank if it's induced by a star regular ring, okay? So there exists a star regular ring and a Sylvester matrix rank function on the star regular ring together with a star homomorphism from the ring to U, so that it recovers the rank, okay? So the rank is the same as uh, going through phi and then computing the rank on U, okay? Then I uh, suppose that rank is a star regular rank on R, so that this property holds. We say that a triple of this form is an epic star regular envelope if the following conditions are satisfied. First, or is a star regular ring. Second, this is a faithful Sylvester matrix rank function on this star regular ring. And third, phi, the third thing here, is a star homomorphism such that the star regular closure of phi of or in or is all the ring, is the ring or. And we can recover the rank, the original ring, through the rank here in the ring, in the new ring, okay? So that's uh, like a um, uh, kind of minimal envelope, minimal star regular envelope. Epic comes from the fact that this, uh, then this homomorphism is an epimorphism of rings, okay, in this situation. Well, uh, and the result is that uh, if you have a star ring with a star regular rank, then, uh, there is, supposing that there is a star regular rank, uh, the, the rank is a star regular, that there exists this star regular algebra given the rank, which is not clear that uh, this will exist, then there exists a unique epic star regular envelope. Okay, so this only depends on the rank, doesn't depend on, well, where we compute this star regular closure. It's independent, completely independent. Okay. If you have any two epic star regular envelopes, then there is a unique star isomorphism such that you can recover one map from the other and you can recover the rank from one to the other. So the ranks are the same and the phi, and phi, phi one and phi, phi two are equivalent in an obvious sense, okay, through this um, homomorphism. Okay, so there is a unique envelope. Now, if she is a discrete group and we have a subfield of the complex numbers plus under conjugation, we denote in this way, or KC, the star regular closure of the group algebra in the star regular algebra U of she. And with these definitions we gave before, this is the epic star regular envelope of this group algebra. So this is the unique star epic star regular envelope. And using the above, we can immediately recover the following well-known result. If you have a torsion-free group, then the strong Atelier conjecture falls for the group algebra if and only if this is a division ring. So this star regular closure is a division ring. Indeed, here will be kind of a proof. So if this uh, conjecture falls for the group algebra, then by definition, the set of values is the set of positive integers. This holds if and only if the corresponding group is the integers. And this holds by what I said before, that the, this uh, uh, state on the K0 is uh, take values on, on integers. And this, because this is faithful and this is regular, is the same as saying that this is a division ring. Okay? So that's the easy proof of this result using this, the theory we have said. Indeed, one can see 
that the strong Gatilla conjecture for torsion free group, in this case, is equivalent to saying that there is some division ring in the middle of the group algebra and this von Neumann algebra and this star regular algebra of the group. Okay, so you see here how stronger is the strong Adelia conjecture than the uh, Kaplansky's conjecture. Kaplansky's conjecture just says that this is a, is a domain, no zero divisors. Here you have a stronger statement saying that there is a division ring containing this uh, group algebra and moreover, this division ring is contained in this in this bigger algebra. Okay, so that's exactly what it means the strong idea conjecture. Okay, and finally, I will describe so from my work with uh, Jean Clara Moon. So here we have um, the following context. So we have a homeomorphism of totally disconnected compact metraceable space X. We have a subfield of the close and of, of the complex numbers plus under com complex conjugation. And also we have a team variant ergodic and full probability measure on the space. Okay. So using these ingredients, now we consider the algebra that, well, I like this kind of notation, uh, is the algebra of continuous functions from X to the field, but where K is endowed with the discrete topology. And uh, this is just the, like the locally constant functions as well. I like to think of them as continuous functions. And we consider the cross product star algebra given by the action of, of this homeomorphism induced here. Okay? So this is our main algebra to consider. And then our result is that uh, one of our results is that there exists a unique faithful Sylvester matrix function rank uh, RK on this algebra, I described it before, with the property that it recovers the measure. Okay? So the rank of the characteristic function of U is the same that the measure of U for any Kloppen subset U of X. Okay? So that's a unique, faithful Sylvester matrix rank function. And moreover, we can give a description this um, the rank completion, completion of this algebra A of this cross product is a star regular ring. And we have a natural inclusion of A of A in this um, in this completion. And now we might consider the star regular closure of A in the completion, and we have this embedding here, okay? So in this case, the star regular this, uh, closure, so this is the epic, the epic star regular ring associated to A is uh, contained in the completion, okay? And this will be the epic star regular envelope, okay? So what is the relation with uh, Tia's problem? So this is the motivating examples are, are these. So suppose that we have a discrete contable abelian torsion group and that set acts on H by automorphisms. That's just as the case of the, of the Lamblighter, in which here we would get this direct sum of copies of set two, okay? Then we can consider the semi-direct product. And then we can consider the, um, the dual will be a compact, totally disconnected group. So it satisfies the condition before. And we get a dual action of the integers on this, uh, on this group, on this space. And we can take the normalized higher measure here. And then it turns out that to study the Atilla problem for this class of group algebras, you can translate it to the study of this kind of cross products, okay? So you translate the problem here and it's enough to consider this star regular closure that you have a good control of, of it because it's contained here in this completion and you know many things about it. So this is a basic tool, okay? So the rank functions coincide under this isomorphism. So I am a little bit late, 
so I, I'm going like faster. But well, if we apply this, this to the lamplighter, we are led to study this algebra here. So this cross product, so the group algebra of the lamplighter will be this A, where X is a scantor space, and T is just the shift map, so the usual shift map on this space. And mu is just the product measure of the one half, one half measure on zero two, zero one, okay? And we have this concrete description of the group algebra of the lamplighter. And then we can study this algebra and it's a star regular closure using these approximation algebras, a sequence of approximation algebras, which almost cover A. So let me recall just some of these algebras. So for example, the smaller one is the one generated by one and the element is zero T as a star algebra. I mean, this is a star algebra, so it's generated by this and the, and the adjoint. Where recall that E0 was this idempotent as before, that they appear in the, in the um, uh, previous slide. And this corresponds to the characteristics uh, function of this Klopen set. So this I denote by this, this Klopen set, this uh, sequences such that X0 is equal to zero. Okay. This is the point zero. And then we observe that this contains indeed the element giving rise to the first counter example of the strong material conjecture. This was the elephant. Similarly, you can consider A1, you can describe it in this uh, concrete way as the star algebra generated by these elements. And these elements, well, more or less the same notation as before, is a bigger algebra here. And well, have the following results. Together with Guderal, we show that the set of values corresponding just to A0, just to the one that contains this element, which was the first counter example for Atiyah's conjecture, the set of numbers corresponding to this is all the rational numbers. So here, all rational numbers are covered by A0. It's very nice. And also we got, in this case, a complete description of this star regular closure in, the, in this paper. In the paper with uh, Jean Claramun, we obtained a lot of uh, irrational numbers. So for any bunch of polynomials like this, and for any natural numbers, there exists an element A inside matrix algebra over the other algebra, A1, so the bigger one, but uh, not too big in some sense, with rational coefficients such that all these l 2 bt numbers appear. So all these are l 2 bt numbers, okay? So uh, where well, these are uh, numbers that can be explicitly computed, and we get a collection of irrational and even transcendental L2 beta numbers arising from the lamplighter. So the lamplighter group contains a lot, a lot of transcendental numbers. And also using an analysis of the algebraic structure of the star regular closure of A1, just this A1, the first one not giving rational values, we also obtain this particular value. So we can see that this algebraic irrational number is an l 2 bt number associated to the lamplighter, indeed to this algebra A1. And this is, was not known. Was not known if an, a number like this, or so simple as this, can appear as l 2 bt number of a group, okay? So, well, I think I have uh, some, a couple of uh, slides more, but I think I, I will skip them. So I, I will finish here. So many thanks for your attention and that's it. So thank you very much, Peter. Uh, <coughs> here I see Jonathan has questions. Uh, yes, I have a question. So uh, this is a really very interesting talk. Um, is it known if there are any counterexamples to the original Atia conjecture that are finitely presented? Uh, yes, yes, I think I think so. Yes, 
Yes, because uh, in the in the paper that I mentioned before by Grabowski, he proved that all um, all real numbers appear as l 2 beta numbers of finally generated groups, if you remember. But in the same paper, he also showed that uh, all uh, the computable, computable, computable real numbers appear as l 2 beta numbers of finally presented groups. And indeed, I think if and only if. So a number is computable if and only if uh, uh, is the l 2 beta number of a finally presented group. Yeah. OK, this thanks. Yeah. It's in the paper of, of, of uh, right. Grabowski. Because for the application to geometry, the finitely presented case is in some sense more interesting because you really, Atiyah was originally interested in L2 betting numbers of manifolds and a yeah. closed manifold that gives a finitely presented group. Yes, yes, no, I know, yes. So this, the answer is yes, there exists, yes. And also there is uh, a description of, of these numbers that contains many numbers, like for example, uh, by all algebraic numbers, so it's a large class. Yes. Well, here, uh, I, I point out that uh, Grabowski is in the audience right now, and ah, he yeah. uh, sent a uh, message to the chat saying, L embeds, yes, L embeds in a finitely presented group. Ah, okay. L the lamp railer group. Yeah. 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 So thank you. Yeah. So are there any more uh, questions? I see Rui has turned on his uh, mm, camera, yes. maybe because he wants to ask something. Exactly. So um, thanks very much for a very nice uh, talk. And uh, so my my question is, if you know the uh, the L two betting numbers for a group G. Uh, and you pass from that group to a semi-direct product with the integers. Uh, can you say anything about the semi-direct product? Or the l 2 numbers of the semi-direct product? Yes. Well, I think this is the problem <laughs> that we have. We, we, we are trying to say something in, in some particular cases of this situation, indeed, because it's the Lamb-Leiter group is of this form, if I understand well. So you have the the direct sum of set two, of the copies of set two. Here, you know everything uh, because here the, oh, right. the Atilla conjecture holds. So you know that here the, the, the uh, l 2 beta numbers will be of, of the course. form one divided, well, multiples of uh, one divided by two to the n. But when you perform the, the semi-direct product, then you don't know uh, what happens. It can oh. appear some some irrational numbers or transcendental numbers. Okay, all right, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So are there any more uh, questions, remarks? So, if there aren't, uh, we thank Pera again. And, uh, and we uh, see each other again next uh, Friday. Right? Okay. So, okay. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. So, Thanks for your attention again. Thank you. Thank you for a beautiful talk.